My name is Angelika Victoria Beresko and I am currently a junior in the School of Art at Cooper Union. My project is related to collective memory of the native faith of Poland, how it is revived through ritual and its subtleties connected to aesthetics. Through my research, it became apparent that what connects current religion, which is Catholicism, main religion of Poland, and the native faith is in fact aesthetics of space and material like wood and um, structures. The funds for the project were mostly spent on the equipment related to sound recording as that is primarily how I embody my research in a creative way. And also a small portion of that has been spent on um, literary works related to research, such as the works of Czesław Miłosz, who speaks about morality of religion and ritual, and also the older texts that are studied in school. I also created uh, multiple short sound works that I called teasers that behave as glimpses into the space and will be further elaborated through modes of translation. Tak, to wszystko. Tak. Dzieją się rzeczy? Prosty był ten śpiew. Śmiesznie jest. Kość, mięso, nerwy są nasze, nie moje. Chyba mnie to jednak dotknie bardziej personalnie, niż jak myślałam wcześniej. Minie zima. Przyjdzie wiosna, ażeby wydać śpiew anonimowy. Słowa! Wszyscy! Słowa! Wczoraj, że wczoraj, to raz ku. Przez tę góreckę do lasku. Wczoraj, że wczoraj, tu lasku. Przez tę góreckę do lasku. Hi, my name is MJ. I'm in the thesis year in architecture school. My project for Mesher looks at the Ger settlements in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Ulaanbaatar is the capital of Mongolia with half of the entire nation's population. And half of the population in Ulaanbaatar live in what is so called in Ger area. Ger area is a unique urban habitation phenomenon caused by the rapid urbanization and migration of herders into the city. It starts with a girl, a round tent structure that is mobile. The construction and material is that of a temporary structure, but Mongolians' life in it is not. They build fences around their plots to claim the ownership of the land. Houses and toilets are built inside the fences, which is kasha, there is a big population living in these informal settlements, and most of them have no basic urban infrastructure, no water, no heating, and no plumbing. The outbreak of COVID-19 has caused a total shutdown in Mongolia, and the whole research was carried out entirely remotely. There were some changes made in my methodologies of research. Instead of site visits and direct observation, I collected GIS data, satellite images and maps from Google Earth and other platforms. I interviewed people on Zoom instead of face-to-face -face talks. These are the questions I asked. What does it mean to live in a gear in the city? What does it mean to live in a gear area in the city? 
What does it mean to live in a tent in a city without the infrastructure? What does it mean to live in a temporary structure in the context of Ulaanbaatar, where the temperature in the winter drops to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit? Gear is more than the material of house to Mongolians. It is proof of their long traditional nomadic history and culture. It is more than the affordability and the means available. It is their identity. Hello everyone, my name is Maximilian. Hi, my name is Zamas, and we're going to be giving you a little introduction and summary of our research for Mencha. So we're going to start with um, the research that we were doing on civic space in New York City. And this was really the start of our Mencha and research we're thinking about what the role of civic space is and what are the distinctions between civic and public. And um, after the murder of George Floyd, civic space became a space for the public's voice. And its occupation began to challenge the social structures and the physical structure of the spaces of civic space. So this was the departure of our interest and research and our proposal began to specify itself after the occupation of city hall and i'll let max speak a little bit about what the occupation of city hall was so just as we uh received the mental and its funds occupy city hall just began to take place uh outside of the it, right in the center of the civic center of New York City and outside of, but in a limited space it, it was in. Our, our main purpose there was to support, participate, and document uh, through an embodied experience and research of what this occupation of civic space was. And for a little context, so this occupation was created on the basis of waiting for the budget to be um, revealed or exposed to to the public in terms of a new budget cut and a new series of funding and with the discontent of how much funding the police department was still getting this occupation became not just one day of protest but it became um kind of the building of a camp or of um of a of a space of of kind of trying to rethink what the the social structures of these civic spaces are giving us. So it became 
the space of mutual aid and education. Uh, jumping into uh, a plan view of what this place offered, um, we can see uh, a lot of the, the kind of transformation of, uh, of this place happened alongside kind of the edges and fences of these places and through found objects and tarps and communal resources, um, we were able to establish uh, several small programs that worked mutually with one another. Mm -hmm. I think really what was um, fascinating to us is that this form of, of life and occupation could happen in any public space and might be a better representation of the public than an empty neoclassical kind of uh, cold space. So I think kind of this questioning of what can the future of public spaces look like and you, looking at this occupation as one of the reference points or like the start of the language of what it could be in terms of materials, in terms of programs, and in terms of community building. The sky from the last time I was on my way to Israel. and you can close them like a TV with the press of a button. I will forever miss the feeling of pushing up the window just so I could watch the Mediterranean sea become the shore. When I step through the open crack of the plane just for the split second before I enter the airport, the smells from my childhood begin to overwhelm me. I remember crying had been going on airport when arriving, and I remember crying and leaving. My family would always pick me up from the airport. There would always be some form of embrace, but this time, things are different. I'm on my way to my grandfather's house for the first time without him leading the way. Already, this is a very different Israel compared to the one my childhood self remembered. I have arrived with the camera to film my observations and to take care of my grandfather who lives here alone. As I enter, I'm struck with forgotten memories. My great-grandmother is no longer here, but everything else remains. אני נמצא פה שישים, שישים ושתיים שנה. התארגנו קבוצה של צמחונים בתל אביב. והסוכנות הסכימה ליישב אותנו בגליל. My camera in my hand, I finally arrive at Amirim, a vegan and vegetarian village where I will spend the next few months building an ecological home to live in, documenting the founders and current inhabitants of the village, connecting to the surrounding nature, learning about raw veganism and gleaning, and discovering if we can unpack the secrets of this village and replicate them all over the world. So far, every day since I got here, I've learned something new. 
This hidden village touches on global issues that pertain to veganism, animal rights, and climate change, and I can't wait to get to share this documentary with you soon. Hi, my name is Zhenya Dementieva. I'm a thesis student in the School of Architecture and a Menschel Fellow in the 2021 cohort. My research for the Menschel Fellowship centers around Soviet films as a way to examine psychological perception of space and explore how that perception might be physicalized in an object. In spite of its physical nature, our understanding of space is largely assembled from the fragments and glimpses in our memory. Because we can exist in but one room at a time, our conception of space is entirely psychological. The speculation about this nature of psychogeography was developed by the Situationists, an alliance of French avant-garde artists, writers, and poets who famously thought of the city as a fantastic landscape, one that exists in many spatial temporal dimensions. Drawing inspiration from the work of Karl Marx and socialist concepts, Guy Debord, a key member of the Situationist movement traces the development of modern society in which authentic social life has been replaced with its representation. He writes, in societies where modern conditions of production prevail, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacle. Everything that was directly lived has reduced into a representation. While the Situationists closely studied society's spectacle in the city, they somehow missed an exploration of space where society finds home. Because the Situationists were committed to exploring the construction of a collective imaginary from individual experiences, it is relevant to consider their practices today, at a time when physical isolation has forced the home to become a world of its own. Moreover, through its glorification by Soviet cinema, the individual home in the USSR became a psychogeography of the collective state of domestic existence. When we visualize spaces in our minds, there are certain objects that serve as fiducial markers in our memory. Furniture, for example, has the ability to root our understanding of space around it. Furniture also played a central part in Soviet domestic space, as it was in a sense the vehicle that defined spatial use. Because there was no designated rooms for sleeping or dining in the Soviet Union, Soviet understanding of domestic space was largely controlled by large storage cabinets serving as machines that enabled eating, sleeping, studying, resting, and recreation. Currently, my research is focused on exploring the strategies for reconstructing interior domestic space using nothing but film stills. Additionally, I am identifying the furniture that defines Soviet domestic space. For the exhibition, I hope to build an object that exemplifies the qualities necessary to define space. Thank you.